Costello is an ambassador from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and he's been working on this type of project for many years. The program will go all into what they're doing and how they hope to get it accomplished. Paul, you're on. Thank you, Vince. Let me uh, share my screen. You don't, I'll have my camera off just because I'd be a distraction. So let me just get my uh, screen going. Here we go. Okay, very good. I want to mention just quickly, uh, during your meeting, suddenly I lost my line and I was gone for about five minutes. So if I should disappear, that means the Martians got me. And uh, just be patient and uh, hopefully things will recycle wherever I'm at and I'll be back. So it hasn't happened to me so far in all the presentations I've done, but you know, if I don't say that, I won't jinx it. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna be talking to you about NASA's uh, next mission to Mars, uh, which is, uh, was originally was called Mars 2020. Now, uh, <clears throat> just another quick introduction to myself. I've been a native, New I am a native New Jerseyan, I've been an amateur astronomer all my life, I belong to the New Jersey Astronomical Association, which is located in Voorhees State Park in Highbridge, New Jersey. Of course, because of this year, we're closed right now, but hopefully we'll open up again next year. We're the largest public observatory in New Jersey. And as Vin said, I also do volunteer speaking for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So what I wanna to do tonight is I wanna talk a little bit about uh, just some of the basics about Mars, what we know about Mars and uh, what's been discovered so far with all the missions that have gone there and then hone in on this new rover uh, that's on its way and uh, what it's going to be looking for. And so what you see there is a real picture of Mars taken by a space probe that was approaching it. You can see Mars is nothing like the Earth. Yeah, there's no oceans, there's no atmosphere to speak of. It has a very, very thin atmosphere. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, but it's a very bleak and cold place. But uh, of all the planets other than Earth, it's the most hospitable to us, which is, which is a stretch. Just some numbers. It's about only 4,200 miles wide and it's 140 so million miles away from the sun. Now, Earth is 93 million miles away from the sun. So that extra 50 million miles makes, Mar makes Mars much, much colder uh, than what we are. Also that diameter of only 4,200 miles, a lot of people don't realize this because there's been so many science fiction movies done about Mars and you see all the, our, our space heroes walking around on Mars like they would on Earth. Well, that's not true. Uh, because Mars is only about half the size of Earth. And when you're half the size of Earth, you've got less mass and less mass means that the force of gravity is only 38% of what it is on Earth. So that means if, uh, if you were a 150 pound person on Earth, you'd only weigh about 57 pounds on Mars. So it's a great, great place to go if you wanna lose weight. Now, how does Mars fit in with the rest of the planets in our solar system? What I've put up here is a slide that shows all eight planets in our solar system, plus the sun, which is off to the left there, that little sliver of yellow. Now, the planets never align this way. They're not this close, but what this does represent is the actual sizes of the planets with respect to each other. So you can clearly see how the first four dots there um, are very small. And then the last four planets are quite large. So the first four planets starting with the first one is Mercury. And then we have Venus, then Earth, and then here's Mars. And then after that are what we call the gas or the ice giants, which is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Well, all these outer planets are so cold and so far from the sun 
Um, they don't even have solid footing. That's why we call them gas giants or ice giants. You can't land on them. So the only thing that's terrestrial are the first four planets. And of those, only our nice Earth is the most comfortable. Now, when scientists talk about life uh, or the ability for life to, to be on another planet, they talk about a habitable zone. And a habitable zone is a planet that is just the right distance away from its star so that liquid water can exist on its surface. And they use that definition because all the life on Earth that we know of needs water to survive in some shape or form. So if they think if, if a planet can have liquid water, then there's the possibility it can have some kind of life, microbial life, advanced life, who knows? Nothing's been found so far. But this chart I'm showing you now is showing the, uh, the first four planets. And that green shaded area is the habitable zone for our star, which is the sun. So that means it's possible for the temperature to be warm enough for liquid water to exist on a planet. So you can see Mercury is way too close to the sun. Uh, the next one, Venus, is right on the edge. It's possible, but unfortunately, Venus is covered in clouds. Uh, and they're not water clouds like we have. They're, um, uh, they're uh, sulfuric acid clouds. And so Venus has a runaway greenhouse effect. And so the surface temperature of Venus is like 900 degrees Fahrenheit. And so there's not going to be liquid water in it as well. Earth, as you can see, is comfortably right in the middle of the habitable zone. And so Mars is. Mars is well within the zone for liquid water to exist. So what happened with Mars? Because we know there's no liquid water there from the picture I showed you before. So let's take a little look about the dynamics of a planet. If we cut away the, uh, the Earth and look down into the core, um, when the Earth was formed, it was one big molten uh, blob of materials. And in time, it cooled and gravity takes over and you have something called uh, this... Um, wrong term, but you, you have a process where uh, the materials that are heaviest fall to the center of the planet. And so what you have, you wind up with is a solid inner core. And our solid inner core is primarily made up of nickel and iron. And it, it's solid because not so much that it's cold, it's not, it's hot, but the pressure of the earth solidifies it. So there's a solid big ball of iron and nickel in the middle of our planet. Now, once you move outward, that iron and nickel is more liquid. Uh, it's still hot, um, but it's not under that much pressure. And so it is a liquid core. And if you have a liquid, you've got movement. And so what happens in that outer core is that iron and nickel is moving. It's churning up and down with the heat flows in the inside of the earth. And any time you have metal that's moving, you have something called a dynamo. And what a dynamo produces is a magnetic field. And so if you remember back in science class, when we took a bar magnet with a north and a south pole, we put a piece of white paper over it and sprinkled on some black iron filings, we got an image that looked like this. And magically that showed us the magnetic field lines of this iron magnet. Well, the earth is the same way. It is a giant magnet. And it also has field lines just like that, that bar magnet. And so you have these huge magnetic field lines reaching out from Earth. Uh, they're the weakest at the poles. That's the function of the magnetic field. But what's great about this magnetic field is that just like the shields on the Enterprise, when Kirk yells to Sulu, shields, Sulu, it protects us from things. And what it mainly protects us from are the electromagnetic particles that are streaming out from the sun all the time. They're high energy um, electrons, neutrons, protons that are streaming out from the sun in all directions. And when it comes toward our planet though, because of this fantastic magnetic field, they, they, they distance themselves around the planet. They glance around like this drawing is trying to show. And so we're protected from these particles and the main thing that we're protected from is the fact that it's not stripping away our atmosphere because our atmosphere is only about a hundred miles high. 
And if it was constantly bombarded by these particles over billions of years, there would be nothing left. And that's what they think is what happened to Mars to give it its current condition. Now, as I mentioned before, you notice how the magnetic field lines are weakest at the poles. And when you have it, because it's so weak at that point, some of those electrically charged particles do hit the upper atmosphere. But what we get is not so much a stripping away of our atmosphere, but we get these beautiful uh, displays of the northern and southern lights. And so uh, that's just more evidence of these particles that are constantly coming out of the sun. Uh, they're energized in the upper atmosphere. And so you have different colors because uh, whatever um, gases they're, they're electrifying, hydrogen, oxygen produces different uh, types of nitrogen, produces different types of colors. Think of it in a sense like plugging in a neon light. When it's electrified, it glows. Same type of thing here in the upper atmosphere. So because we have a magnetic field, our atmosphere is protected. But poor Mars, being so small, only about half the size of the Earth, uh, and uh, it, it didn't have this magnetic field. It may have at one time, but it doesn't, they don't believe it has it now. And because of that, the, uh, the particles from the sun uh, stripped away its atmosphere. Uh, what atmosphere it has left is only 1% of Earth's atmosphere is extremely thin. It's like being on Mount Everest. And the uh, composition of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. So even if there was a lot of it, we couldn't breathe it. So this is why Mars looks the way it does. And it's devoid of any <clears throat> water on the surface because there's no pressure to, uh, to hold it there. Uh, there's no big, thick clouds. There's no vegetation. There's nothing. It's uh, pretty much a desert planet. Now, this is a real image of the surface of Mars. And indeed, it does look like a desert here. But one thing I want to caution you, anytime you think about Mars, never think of Mars as being warm or hot, like a real desert. Uh, when I say desert here, I mean desert meaning lacking water. And so there's no water on the surface, but it's also very cold um, because again, it's far from the sun. The average temperature is only about minus 80. Uh, it can get to an actual 68 degrees Fahrenheit at noon if you're standing at the equator at the right time of year for a few, for a few hours, but that's about it. Other than that, the coldest part is like minus 240 degrees at the poles. So it's a very, very cold place. So that's what we know of Mars uh, so far. And uh, when NASA uh, and other countries now have started to send uh, probes to Mars uh, to study its everything, to study its atmosphere, to study its surface, um, they had to turn to the engineers about how do you get a scientific package to Mars. And you have to think about Mars as being farther from the sun, so therefore its orbit is farther out and being farther away from the sun, it's going to go slower. So a Mars year is almost two of Earth years. And so Earth will spin around the sun once, and Mars has only gone about halfway around the sun. So it's, it's trailing us uh, in a slower orbit. So what the engineers have to do with their rock, rocket technology, it, it's kind of like throw, a quarterback throwing a, a long pass to, to a receiver they throw it in the area where they expect the receiver to be. And it's the same thing with Mars. So Mars has to be in a right position at the right time and a rocket has to be launched and then it's sent ahead of Mars. And they figure it takes about six or seven months just to reach Mars's orbit. But they've got to uh, target it at the right point so that Mars will be there when the space probe gets there. And that's exactly why you may have heard that uh, the space agencies around the world only send uh, packages to Mars every about every two years, because that's when the two planets align enough for them to launch the rocket. And so a few months ago was one of those times. Uh, another time will be two years from now and everybody will be launching more rockets then. But uh, it was last October, I believe, where, uh, where the Mars mission was then launched. I mentioned other countries. Uh, this is the first time two other countries are, have launched during the same month. Uh, the Chinese have launched their 
their their probe they have a very ambitious probe they have a lander a rover and an orbiter that's on the left there it's called Taiwan 1 and uh, they hope to do all those things in the vicinity of Mars come February when everybody reaches Mars very ambitious the Chinese uh, on the right side there is the first time the United Arab Emirates is actually sent uh, a probe to Mars. Uh, they use the, they don't have rockets of their own, but they use the Japanese uh, rockets. They, they have a pretty good space fleet. So their probe is called HOPE. It's going to stay in, in Mars orbit and it's going to measure the atmosphere. So lots of science heading to Mars uh, as we speak. Now, over the years, a lot of probes have been sent to Mars uh, ever since the 70s. Uh, many of them have not made it. Almost half of them have either uh, malfunctioned on the way or crashed. So only those uh, five types of probes that you see in the middle, which were all done by, by NASA, have survived. You've got going from left to right, you've got the Viking missions. There were two of them, uh, the small Sojourner mission, uh, the ones that are probably most in everybody's memory in the past few years was the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. Uh, there was a, one there that was for only for less than a year called Phoenix. And then uh, Curiosity, which is another big size rover. And it's still there now after six years and it's still working just fine. So this is what's been on Mars so far. A little quick review of, of the exploration of Mars and what they've learned so far. This was the Mars Viking lander uh, that was in the 70s. There were two of these big, big uh, built. They're a big son of a guns. They're about the size of a car. Uh, and they had both an orbital component and a lander component. And so this is very exciting back in 75 because both of them landed successfully. And uh, when anything lands on Mars, the engineers always want to see how did it land? Did it land okay? Are the landing uh, uh, landing legs okay? Are, are we on a level surface? Uh, tell us what we need to know uh, to make sure that we can continue the mission. And so what you often see from a, a space probe once it lands is a black and white image of the ground uh, showing the landing pad. And that's what you see here. So this was officially the very first photo taken from the surface of Mars. Not that exciting, but the engineers loved it. Then the camera mounted on the upper part of the uh, Viking uh, took this shot. And so this was the first color image of the uh, surface of Mars. Now, I'll tell you right now, it's never that, it's not that bright. This has been enhanced. Mars is, again, it's farther from the sun. And so it's going to be dimmer uh, on the surface. And uh, But this was enhanced so they can see all the detail. And you can clearly see how Mars is red. Um, and you can see it in the night sky. And by the way, Mars is in the sky right now. And it's, gonna, it's been there for a few weeks and it's going to be there for a few more weeks. It's almost straight overhead and once it gets dark. And when you look, it's very bright. And when you look at it, you can clearly see that it's pink or red, even here in New Jersey. And the reason it's got that reddish surface is because there's a lot of iron on the surface and the iron combined with whatever oxygen was there at one time and it made it ferrous oxide and ferrous oxide is rust. And so the surface of Mars is sort of rusting. So we got our first pictures of, of Mars through the Viking and that was all fine and good. The, the Viking was not a rover, it just sat there. It did a few experiments. Um, they were happy they were able to land there and that pretty much was the mission. But then uh, scientists, of course, wanted to know more about the planet. And so they decided to send an orbiter and let's get a global map of the entire planet. And so in 97, they sent the Mars Global Surveyor and that's exactly what it did. It was in a what we call a polar orbit. And so it could circle the planet and then the planet would rotate beneath it. Mars rotates almost 24 hours a, a day, just like Earth. And so it would move under it and the surveyor would snap pictures like crazy. And so um, clearly you can see in this image here, um, there are craters all over the place. And these are from things that fall into Mars, meteors, uh, comets and asteroids over the billions of years that Mars has been around. The craters are still there just like on the moon because Mars has got such a thin atmosphere that uh, materials like that don't burn up in the atmosphere. They just crash right into the surface. But the uh, center there, the main uh, 
um, crater in the center there is actually from an extinct volcano. And uh, so that shows that Mars was indeed molten at one time, had a molten core or magma at one time. But there are no uh, active volcanoes on Mars now, which again leads the scientists to believe that the molten core is either gone or, or maybe very, very small. Just a, a note that uh, fuzzy white stuff you see around that uh, around that crater is actually uh, the carbon dioxide that's come out of the air and f and 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 developed a frost on the crater. And so when you have frozen carbon dioxide, we think of it as dry ice, and that's what it is. There's some dry ice forming on the edges of the crater. This is another view of the largest volcano in our entire solar system. This is a great one to remember for Jeopardy questions or trivia questions. Where's the largest volcano in the entire solar system? Well, you can say it's on Mars and it's called Olympus Mons. Again, it's extinct, but it was it is absolutely huge. If you took it and put it on the Earth, it would cover the entire area of Arizona. So Mars may be a small planet, but it likes to do things in big ways. Now, Surveyor um, found lots and lots of fascinating pictures of the surface of Mars. It clearly uh, lots of uh, plain uh, desert looking type of surface, but there are also these very beautiful images of sand dunes uh, sculpted by the slight breeze that you can get on Mars. Mars, again, because of its thin atmosphere, doesn't have a terrific wind, but it does have a breeze that uh, over again, over billions of years is going to sculpt the surface into different shapes, just like here on Earth. And so these are actually uh, sand dunes. The uh, it, Mars's polar caps are, of course, the coldest part of the planet. And so if the uh, water vapor or carbon dioxide is going to freeze out of the atmosphere, it's going to collect there in a significant quantity to make a polar cap. So the polar caps have been examined and they're a combination of both uh, carbon dioxide and and water ice. So we know that there's some water there, but it's uh, going to be in frozen form, if any. But this is what really intrigued the scientists. They started to see things like this. Now, the orbiter, that surveyor was around Mars for a very long time, and so it took repeat pictures of, of the same areas. And they started to see these streaks in, uh, along crater walls. And they were trying to figure out what the heck is causing these, these streaks. It sure looks like something is falling down the edges of the crater. They know it can't be surface water because water can't exist on the surface due to the uh, low pressure. But something is falling down these crater walls. And so there's some theories that it's just sand or, or rocks or things that are tumbling down. But there's also other theories that maybe there's frozen water just under the surface. And every now and then, it gets warm enough for that ice to melt under the surface and then you know, slowly drift the, down the side of the crater wall. The, the, the book is out on this right now, but it's certainly worth investigating. But what really, really, really intrigued them was when they started to see pictures like this of the surface. And the one on the right clearly, clearly looks like a dried up riverbed. And the one on the left also kind of shows a fluid action and almost like the shape of a delta, like the Mississippi Delta uh, forming there. And so they started to see this all over the planet. And they came to realize that, look, it's, it's obvious. Mars at one time had water. Mars one time was, was wet on its surface. In fact, uh, it's said to be that Mars was so wet that it literally had an actual ocean in its northern area. So this got scientists excited because, like I said earlier, where there's water, there's life, at least as life as we know it. So in 2001, they sent another orbital probe, this one called Mars Odyssey. And this was specialized to send down a spectrographic beam that would uh, examine the surface and just under the surface, looking for signs of hydrogen. And everywhere you see blue on this map, is where it reflected back the hydrogen atom. And as you know, hydrogen is, a, is an atom that's part of the of water, H2O. And so they think that everywhere that you see blue on this map, there is water just under the surface, most likely frozen. And so 
that got them really, really curious. And this is a map that they, uh, or a drawing that they drew of Mars, uh, computing the amount of water that could have been on the surface at one time before the atmosphere was stripped away. And so Mars may have looked like this with a huge ocean on the, uh, on the northern part of the planet. So now it's time uh, for them to get real serious with their exploration of the surface. So in 2003, NASA sent two Mars exploration rovers to the planet. These were um, about golf cart size rovers. They are powered by solar panels. They were loaded with cameras. Uh, it even had a robotic arm that stuck, uh, stuck out in the front there that could uh, examine rocks up close and send back uh, information to the geologists waiting on Earth. And the most important thing was, is it could move. It didn't move real fast, but it could move around and go to different areas uh, to uh, search out different samples. These are some of the pictures that were taken by the rovers. Um, they came upon this group of boulders that clearly looked different than everything else. And then they analyzed it and they found that the, these were uh, thrown out from a volcano. Uh, these were boulders from uh, one of those active volcanoes at that time. Uh, here's another picture of the sand dunes. Uh, could, could look like someplace right here on the deserts of Earth. And then uh, it, during the many days that I was exploring, one of the engineering cameras talk, uh, caught this fuzzy thing in the distance. And they're saying, well, what the heck is this? What, what is making that uh, kind of a impression on Mars? And so they studied it for a while and they came to a realization that this was a dust devil just like we have dust devils here on Earth. Now the, the wind, the atmosphere is thin on Mars, so the wind isn't that powerful, but they felt uh, that these were small dust devils that were being created by the same type of vortexes that they're created here on Earth. Here's one in, uh, in I forget, well, in Washington, uh, the state of Washington that was uh, just happened to be passing down the road. Um, if anybody's ever experienced one of these things, they're not terribly dangerous. They can knock over uh, garbage cans and things like that. They don't last very long, but they're like, think of it like a mini tornado. So once they realized that these kinds of things existed on Mars, they kept an eye out for them. And then here's a great picture from orbit of a dust devil uh, pushing its way across Mars. You can see the impression that it made. It, uh, stirred up the ground there, and uh, you can see the tail uh, flying up into the atmosphere. Now, uh, and then here's another uh, picture that they had. They didn't know what was causing these at first, and then when they found the dust devils, they realized that they leave these uh, so-called scratches all over the surface. So there's quite a lot of them, at, at, depending on the time of year. Now, it turned out this was really beneficial for the Mars rovers because they had that uh, solar panel that was on the top of them. And Mars being very dusty, uh, they would the, the amount of electricity that was produced by those solar panels would degrade over time because they were getting dirty. But uh, every now and then, one of these dust devils would happen by and woof, it was kind of like an air blown car wash. And uh, it cleaned off the rover and it gave it new life and new energy for the solar panels. So thank you, Mars, for being very kind to our rovers. So uh, a lot of information was gathered by that. And uh, now by 2006, the advances in imaging with photography uh, grew in leaps and bounds with all the digital photography advances. And so they sent another uh, orbiter to Mars. This one's strictly to do an in-depth reconnaissance of the entire planet. Um, it had it was armed with all these latest cameras, camera uh, technology, and also they orbited it at a much lower altitude. And so here's just one picture uh, that I, I picked from the thousands that it has taken. And now this is colorized so you can see the detail. But if you look in the upper left there, um, kind of imagine this now, you're looking straight down onto the surface of Mars. What you're seeing on the upper left is a landslide. Uh, it happened to catch a landslide in, in action as uh, some of, the, of Mars uh, left uh, the edge of a hill or, or mountain or something and uh, cascaded down into the plain below. So that's the kind of imaging that uh, this uh, satellite can do. And so from that, they learned a tremendous amount about the surface and uh, and it helped them with the planning for landing future future landers. 
2008, they sent the Mars Phoenix. Now, the Mars Phoenix was not a rover. It was go just going to land in the northern latitudes of Mars and see what the northern latitudes were like. The top two pictures on my slide here is a, are drawings. Uh, the bottom two are real uh, pictures taken from the Phoenix. So in the upper left, that's how the Phoenix landed. It came down on good old standard rockets, just like Buck Rogers. In the upper right, once it landed, uh, it extended those solar panels so it could power itself. And it also had a claw that would come out to take samples of the soil and then bring it up to the uh, top of Phoenix, where there was a small scientific package that could analyze the soil for what it was composed of. So it landed successfully. And now look at the bottom left picture. Um, that, again, is one of those engineering shots that they love to see the landing gear and how did it land. And again, very nicely, it, it did uh, land uh, well. The gear is, is firmly entrenched in Mars. But look at the surprise they found. Look at what's under the lander. Those two white, shiny, flat mounds that you see there, that's water ice. The rocket exhaust had blown away the surface of Mars at that point, and it, uh, there was water. There was frozen water right there. And so they had theorized that there might be frozen, uh, ice, uh, frozen water just under the surface. And without doing any kind of excavation, bingo, the, uh, the, the lander did it for them. When the scoop was uh, let out, the picture on the lower right, they took a picture of what it looked like after the, the scoop had uh, scratched the surface. And even there, uh, just under the surface, you could see this white uh, showing up and they analyzed it and it wasn't carbon dioxide ice, it was water ice. And so I was very happy to know that our future astronauts, if they need to get to H2O, they might just have to find a place where there's ice under the surface and just dig a little and shovel it into their uh, machines. They'll break out the H2O into hydrogen and oxygen. And with, the, with those two uh, elements, they can do a lot. So that's good news for future explorers. Uh, six years ago, six years ago, eight years ago, the uh, another uh, rover was launched. This one got bigger it's, uh, and uh, more powerful. And uh, it was called, it was named Curiosity. It was uh, initially called the, My, My, the Mars Science Laboratory because it was really packed with lots of scientific instruments. And so it was a very uh, high, high potent rover. Uh, and it had that uh, arm that would come out the front. But this one would not just uh, look at rocks up close, but it actually had a drill on it. So it could pulverize uh, samples, uh, bring them back into the body of the rover and do uh, analysis on them right there. So it was a very top-notch scientific machine. These are all the instruments that it had. It ha leave it to NASA. It's got all these funny names and whatnot, but mainly they're, um, they're spectrographic type of, of, uh, of uh, uh, equipment. Um, that, do, that does any kind of a chemical analysis. Uh, these are all, again, designed by geologists. This is what they would do if they were there. And so they designed this robot to try to do as much of the analysis as they would do if they were there. I just want to show you a few of the pictures because once again, uh, we're talking now uh, 2006. Um, the, again, the imagery of photography has quadrupled you know we're doing 4k work now and look this is this is as if you were standing on the surface of mars looking straight down look at the detail that you can see it's really really quite amazing one kind of interesting thing here with the curiosity is on that arm on that robotic arm that it can extend it also has a camera and so it can turn the camera around and look at itself and so um, with today's social media, it really is a curiosity it was taking a selfie. And so you see that's the actual rover on the planet with Mars in the background. And that's just you know amazing that uh, here it is uh, 50 million miles away from Earth and we're just taking pictures of ourselves. This is where Curiosity is 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 and is going to continue to go. It went to a uh, a small mountain called Mount Sharp. 
and it's uh, slowly, slowly uh, climbing up into it, and it's examining different areas uh, on this uh, mountain uh, because each area, as it goes through different uh, layers, it's actually like different time periods in the history of Mars, and so they can learn more about how Mars was in the past as well as the present. Here's a nice picture from the surface uh, right after sunset. Um, just like I told you, you can see Mars tonight if you well if it's clear, you can look straight up and you'll see Mars in the sky, very bright, very pinkish. Well, this is what Earth would look like if you were on Mars looking back at Earth. If you can't see it, it's that dot in the upper left. Um, but that little dot right there is us. And so if you're on Mars, you'd say, you see that pale blue dot? That's where we're from. And so maybe someday our grandchildren or whoever will be there and be able to take that shot and send it back. Now that brings us up to the current time. So we're in this two year period now where we can send probes to Mars and NASA wants to take advantage of that. And so they had named this rover simply the Mars 2020 rover. I'll explain how it got its name in just a moment. <clears throat> but uh, this is a drawing of it. it they use the same model type as the uh, Curiosity. Curiosity worked very well. It's still working. And uh, of course, they made some improvements, but it's basically the same type of design, same type of landing craft. Now, anytime NASA has a uh, mission to another planet, uh, they want to give the students of the United States a chance to name it. And so they ask students uh, to write an essay as to uh, to propose a name and why it should have that name. And so this is uh, Alex Mather uh, from Virginia, and over 28,000 entries were submitted, but his was selected. And here's a short video of Alex reading his essay and explaining why he named the rover Perseverance. Curiosity, insight, spirit, opportunity. If you think about it, all of these names of past Mars rovers are qualities we possess as humans. We're always curious and seek opportunity. We have the spirit and insight to explore the moon, Mars, and beyond. But if rovers are to be the qualities of us as a race, we miss the most important thing, perseverance. We as humans evolved as creatures who could learn to adapt to any situation, no matter how harsh. We are a species of explorers and we will meet many setbacks on the way to Mars. However, we can persevere. We, not as a nation, but as humans, will not give up. The human race will always persevere into the future. So thank you, Alex, for naming the rover as a great name. So the rover is now called Perseverance. Now the goals for this mission, there are four of them. And what Curiosity has done so far, the mission that's there right now, what Curiosity has done, one of its main goals was to see if the, uh, the, uh, the chemicals on the planet, the composition of the rocks and the, uh, the conditions were the conditions at one time ever suitable for life to begin? And it it showed that it could. Uh, it was only there a month, and they came back uh, with a successful conclusion to their experiment that yes, Mars at one time could possibly have developed life if the conditions were there long enough. It takes millions, if not billions of years for life to evolve. And so this mission is going to now look to see if there's any evidence of life ever existing. And again, every time I say life now, realize we're talking uh, microbial life. We're not talking about uh, giraffes and rhinoceros and elephants and things like that. We're talking about small single celled type of uh, animals or, or life. So that's one of its main goals. The goal is to characterize the climate of Mars. Uh, Yes, we know a lot about it from all the, the surveys so far, but if we're going to say an astro astronaut's there someday, uh, really need to know what the weather is like on Mars, how volatile it is, and uh, how dangerous it might be. Uh, same thing about the geology. Uh, the more the, ge the, the geologists learn about Mars, the more they'll know 
about its history and what happened to the water and uh, any possible life that may have been there. And then, of course, finally, uh, they want to do some experiments and, and understand, get a better understanding of what's it going to be like if, if we want to get send humans there uh, and if we want to leave them there for a while. Uh, it all depends on how the plans are shaping up for that. And so they'll be doing some experiments for preparing for human exploration. This is a, uh, a map of Mars, and I'm showing here where all the current landers uh, are or have been. Uh, only Curiosity is working right now. It's on the lower right there. But Perseverance is going to be going over into that darkish area that you see there uh, toward the right. Now, because it's looking for past evidence of life or possibly current life, um, they, again, following the water, they think a great place to go is where water seemed to be for a long time and where it pooled. And so there's a crater in this area called Jezero Crater. The crater was, was created by gosh knows what. But the thing was, is because it was a crater, the water drifted into it. It looks like there was, a, now this is a drawing. This is what they think happened. Um, the, uh, water could have uh, streamed down in rivers and pooled into this crater and then uh, went off to the right, forming again like a delta. This is what uh, Jezero looks like today. And uh, so uh, clearly the, uh, the signs of, of water flow or fluid flow are still there, but again, no surface water. This is a colorized image taken from orbit uh, that shows this, this delta pattern that may have come from that crater. And so if there was any rich deposits of anything uh, from that lake, this is where they may have, have rested and there may be still, uh, what, skeletal remains of microorganisms? Who knows? So what they did is they took the framework from Curiosity and they, again, they beefed up, beefed it up, made improvements, but they replaced all the experiments from geological experiments to life-seeking experiments. And so I'm not going to go over each one, but you can see in the descriptions for each of these that we're talking about a spectrometer. Spectrometer is a method whereby you can learn the uh, chemical components of something from a distance by looking at the light that it gives off. And so there's an X-ray spectrometer, an ultraviolet spectrometer, and uh, of course, panoramic cameras for the surface. There's even a radar that can penetrate just under the surface, um, see what's there. Maybe they can see more water ice. And one of the most interesting ones uh, for humans is the one on the bottom, it's called MOXIE, uh, but it's a small experiment that's going to try to take an oxygen atom out of the carbon dioxide atoms in the atmosphere. It's gonna to try to take uh, carbon dioxide, change it to carbon monoxide and extract an oxygen item, atom. And if they can do that, well, then that proves uh, that they can produce oxygen on the surface of Mars, which is going to be a handy thing to be able to do oxygen to breathe and oxygen to use as an oxidizer for rockets. Something new on this rover that's never been done before is they're going to equip it with two microphones. Now there's not a lot of sound on Mars because the air is so thin, but it would be really interesting to hear the rover clanking along on the ground and maybe some whispering sounds from the, uh, from the, the from the breezes and the, uh, and the dust storms that go by. What's, what, what these microphones are also going to be active during the landing period. Now that's quite violent and noisy. So if they can get uh, recordings from the landing, which you'll see in a little bit, um, that'll be really, really exciting. So looking forward to hearing the sounds of Mars. I can see the album cover now. Now, what it's going to do is it's going to, of course, take samples all around Mars, but it's not just gonna drill and examine the samples. It's actually going to take core samples. It's going to um, drill into the surface. This is a short video that's gonna show uh, what this will do. This is an animation. But uh, by the way, that X thing on the back of the rover is its power source. I'll talk about that in a minute. And that's about how slow the rover uh, moves. But the arm will come out and into an area that they want to examine and you'll see that it's just not drilling, 
but it's actually taking a core of the ground. And it's going to retrieve that and take it and put it back inside the rover. Inside the rover are something like 40 uh, hermetically sealed tubes that will preserve and protect the sample and it will keep them. It'll do some analysis while it's on Mars, but it'll keep them for further uh, study back on Earth. And what they're going to do is they're actually going to drop them on the surface and retrieve them. This is a short video of Katie Morgan, who's going, who's, the, who's going to be working on, on this type of, uh, this type of uh, activity. When you go to another the planet, rover. there's just so much potential for making brand new discoveries. My name is Katie Stack Morgan, and I study rocks on other planets. So Mars 2020 will be seeking signs of ancient life in the rock record of Mars. The instruments are really well suited to look for things that we call biosignatures, which are signs that ancient life might have been there in the past. To really confirm that life had a hand in, in creating those signatures or textures, we really do need to bring those samples back. We have capabilities and laboratories here on Earth that we can't fit in a compact instrument on a rover. This is the Mars Yard and this is where our rovers practice driving over rocky terrain. We work together with the engineers to understand what type of terrain the rover can handle so we can get to the most exciting places which are often the most challenging. So our landing site for Mars 2020 is Jezero Crater. What's really exciting about Jezero is that it has a beautifully preserved delta. They tend to be a really good place to preserve evidence of past life. And we look for things like organic matter that get concentrated in the rocks of a delta. So this rock is a sandstone, not unlike a rock that we might actually find in Jezero Crater. We would be interested in sampling a rock like this to understand what each individual sand grain has to tell us about Mars and its evolution. Growing up as a kid, we used to go on lots of hikes and would visit national parks for summer vacations. So when I found out that I had the opportunity to combine geology and love of the outdoors with exploring rocks on another planet, I thought, you know, this is really the perfect type of thing for me to do. Not only could I work on an interesting science project, but I could do it with a big team of people all working together with a focus goal. And I thought that's what I want to do. So that's one of the scientists that's going to be following the activities of the rover. And like I said, uh, those tubes that it has collected, the core samples, it's going to drop them uh, collectively in a certain area or more than one area of Mars where they'll be later retrieved by another rover that will have a launcher on it and it will take it back into orbit and then it will meet up with another craft that will then bring it back to Earth. Now that sounds quite ambitious, and indeed it is. In fact, they're not uh, expecting these samples to get back to Earth until something like 2031. Uh, but they have to start somewhere, and unless Elon Musk beats them to the punch, uh, this is the current plan for getting uh, actual Mars materials back to Earth. I mentioned before about that X on the back of the rover. It was its power source. I just want to mention, uh, as I get questions on this, is it doesn't use solar panels. Uh, so what they did is they, they uh, put some plutonium into a, uh, a housing like this. And what happens with anything that's radioactive is in time it decays. When it decays, it uh, produces heat and that heat can be applied to a thermocouple, which then makes electricity. The rover doesn't need a lot of it, uh, but this uh, plutonium decay uh, gives it enough energy so that it can last for uh, several years if necessary. The expected life of the, uh, of the of Perseverance is only two years, but you know what NASA uh, does is somehow they tend to triple the life expectancy of anything they, they send out there. Um, there's the, uh, they call it an RTG for short, radio thermal uh, generator, radio isotope thermal generator, and there it is being mounted on the back of the rover. One other exciting uh, uh, add addi additional experiment to the uh, Perseverance is what they call a technology demonstration. And what they want to try is they want to try to see if they can fly a uh, uh, well, they call it actually a, a helicopter. It's not just a drone. They say they want to see if they can fly a helicopter on Mars. And so this is a small drone-like um, object. Um, it's uh, got twin rotors and it's on the Perseverance um, uh, 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 rover. 
and they're actually going to try and uh, fly this on Mars. If they can just, uh, if they can see if it can go, if it can fly in the thin atmosphere of Mars, uh, they're definitely going to expand on this in future rovers. Uh, for you can you can imagine how it would increase the uh, area, the ways to explore Mars. So here's another vehicle that's going to Mars. And so once again, they they, they let the students of the United States uh, name it. And so Vanessa Rupani from Alabama. Uh, wrote a essay and she was uh, uh, chosen to name it and it, she named it Ingenuity. So you'll be hearing about Ingenuity when the, when the rover lands. Now, um, you know, engineers design it, but they know that uh, again, with that thin, very thin atmosphere, uh, they're going to have to spin up those rotors really fast. And so I believe they're clocked at 2,400 RPMs, and that's what they think they need to get up into the thin atmosphere of Mars. Now, one thing that works in their favor is that the gravity is less. And so uh, they put this together, and they put it into a, they tested it in the vacuum chamber. What you're seeing here is the test that they did. So that chamber has uh, the pressure of Mars's atmosphere. There's a little line holding it up, but that's to balance out the gravity of Earth. Um, but they were very happy that once they spun it up, got it up to speed, uh, that puppy uh, took off just like that, and they were very happy. And so it seems to work here. Now we'll see if it works on Mars. Um, it's actually carried underneath the rover. And so if it successfully lands and checks itself out, one of the things it's gonna do is drop it, uh, uh, roll away a bit, and uh, it's the, the actual rover is going to command the Ingenuity to do its thing and go up and down several times and, uh, and, see, uh, and see what happens. It, uh, Ingenuity has a small solar panel on the top to, uh, to power it. It's only four pounds. It's uh, very, very light, and it's just all the motor, rotors, and uh, that's about it. This is a picture of the engineers uh, putting it on the uh, rover. Uh, you can see it's it may only be four pounds, but it looks uh, quite formidable. So it was uh, just this past October then where the uh, Perseverance was packaged up into its uh, flight shell uh, put into the nose cone of a uh, rocket. And then of course that rocket, uh, excuse me, the nose cone was put on top of the rocket and uh, they invited uh, Alex and Vanessa to the launch since they named the two craft. And uh, I don't know why I said October, I'm sorry, this is back in July. And so July 30th uh, was the launch and it went off on time and it was successful and uh, away uh, Perseverance went uh, just last July 30th. Now, I think I mentioned uh, that it takes six or seven months to get to Mars. Uh, and so uh, it's got a long journey ahead of it. It's more than halfway there now. Next, I'm gonna show you a video that uh, is an animation of what it's like to land on Mars. And it's quite dynamic uh, because Mars is 15 light minutes away from Earth. So they can't control it in real time. Uh, whatever happens on the rover, we're not gonna know about it until 15 to 20 minutes later. So the landing sequence uh, and, and pattern has to all be programmed into it um, uh, for it to land itself. And so uh, it's, it's quite nerve wracking for NASA to just listen and hear what happened. Um, but this is a video that's gonna show you uh, uh, how it's going to hopefully work. This is the uh, Atlas delivering Perseverance to orbit, and then it spins up and then shoots it out toward Mars. And so Perseverance is uh, all folded up inside that cone. Uh, the ring that you see around it is instruments and solar panels to power it on its six month journey. After six months, it gets to Mars, don't need the ring anymore, and now Perseverance is on its landing its shell is on its own. Even though Mars's atmosphere is thin, you, the, the, pro, the mission, the ship is going uh, 12,000 miles an hour, and so it's going to heat up as it goes through the atmosphere. The atmosphere is going to slow it down, which is what they want it to do, uh, but it also has to make sure it comes in straight 
and doesn't tumble and so that the heat shield can take the brunt of the uh, of the energy once it passes through the upper layer of the atmosphere it uh, lets out a small drogue chute just to steady it can't land with a parachute the air is too thin but the drogue will help uh, balance it then it gets rid of the uh, heat shield doesn't need it anymore and it starts its uh, descent onto the down to the surface now there's the rover tucked inside and once it gets to a certain altitude it just drops it and rockets fire up and it starts searching uh, for its landing place it has cameras like I said it's got microphones so hopefully we'll hear this and once it finds the right spot it's going to lower the rover down by cables. This is a sky crane maneuver which is used by the military and uh, it will gently, hopefully nice and gently, lower the rover onto the surface. Once it makes contact with the surface the, uh, it'll, it'll cut the cables and the landing craft will then fly away and get out of the way and Perseverance will be all on its own to uh, check itself out send signals back to Earth, and hopefully the very first picture uh, from Perseverance on the surface of Mars. One of the things that they've added to this mission is that because they have such detailed maps of the surface of Mars, uh, they've uh, put those maps inside Perseverance so that as it lands, it can then match what it's seeing with the maps to make sure it's in the right landing area. And uh, if, uh, if it's not, uh, if it's close, uh, they can divert it to a safe landing zone if necessary. Now, I'd like everybody to write this date down because this is when all this action is going to happen. It's February 18th of next year. It's not that far away. And it's, um, it's going to be that day because it's on its way to Mars and it's, nothing's going to stop it. So uh, one way or another, it's going to go into the atmosphere of Mars on February 18th. Now NASA will be doing a, a live uh, uh, TV at that time, uh, and we'll stand there, we'll be there watching Mission Control uh, sweat it out. If you would like to know more about Perseverance and where I get some of my information, just go to mars.nasa.gov. It's just filled with all types of information. If you've got uh, youngsters in your family that uh, need a project to do, this is a great, great project to do for school. Um, it gives status reports on uh, all the missions that are at Mars or on their way to Mars. Um, it uh, um, gives uh, lots and just lo lots of information, not only just lots of, uh, you know, words and numbers, it also has lots of videos uh, that can be uh, used. You can see the one I have there of Katie Morgan at the bottom, uh, but it talks all about how it was built and some of the other designs that are in it. Now, this one, that uh, this feature that they've added to their Mars website is absolutely fantastic. They actually created a photo booth so that you can take a picture of yourself or anything and put yourself on Mars. It's a fantastic uh, feature. I've used it many times and it's a lot of fun. You just uh, go here, go to Google Mars Perseverance Photo Booth and you upload an image that you've taken of yourself. Now you wanna take it with a, a not too uh, complicated background. For example, Thanksgiving, I was at my niece's house and I just told her to stand outside uh, be like Vanna White and gesture like this and put her in the sunlight like that. And then presto changeo, I was able to create this image of her uh, showing us the rover on Mars. Now, I didn't do this. This is not me with Photoshop. This is this is NASA. So what you do is, you. oh, by the way, you can uh, also put anything on Mars. I decided to put my cat also. But anything you can get a clear uh, picture of, you just upload it with that button that I showed you before, and it'll upload the, the picture, it'll cut out the background for you, and it'll just put it into the picture of your choice. You've got four choices here. You can be at the launch pad, mission control, uh, in the laboratory or on Mars. Um, and so what's great is you can you can print that. You can download it. It's yours. You can email it. 
uh, you can print it. And so, you know, you can have lots of people put it on their refrigerators and say, hey, look at this, I'm on Mars. And again, be great for a school project. There's other things you can do too with the NASA missions. Uh, not only do they let you name the probe, but they also allow you to send your name to Mars. And so uh, a couple of years ago, I think I signed up. Uh, I'm part of their frequent flyer club because I've done this more than once. And uh, they'll send you a uh, boarding pass. That's another fun thing to email people or put on your refrigerator. And uh, they also then take your name and they put it on a chip. And there are over 10 million names that were sent in. And so they put them on a series of three chips. And there you see them right on the top girder on the Mars rover. So I don't know about you, but I'm going to Mars next month. So once again, keep in mind the landing is February 18th. I think it's a Thursday. It's very comfortably for us in New Jersey here. It's 3.30 in the afternoon. Just tune to NASA TV and you can witness the, uh, there's a lot, uh, this is old, 77 days is a long time from now, but it's uh, not that far. And you can watch the, uh, you can watch them land on Mars. I actually think I've been asked, I think uh, on the 18th, I'm actually going to do a simulcast with, uh, with the NASA TV in the background. And so I'm gonna be asking questions and talking about the Mars rover on that day. So if you're interested in attending that and listening with me, uh, send me an email and I'll put you on the list and I'll let you know the details as February 18th gets closer. But uh, here's a star map of our current sky at night. And right there, that big white dot you see there, right almost in the middle, a little bit low of center, that's Mars. It's right up high in the sky. And so if it's a clear night, just go outside, look straight up, and you'll see this pinkish bright uh, star, not a star, that's Mars. If you're also interested in astronomy and photography, uh, and uh, not so much that you're doing it yourself, but if you just have an interest in it, I, I monitor a Facebook group called New Jersey Astronomy Group. And it's just uh, lots of people who enjoy uh, uh, hearing about what's going on in astronomy. And there's a lot, a lot of talented astrophotographers here in New Jersey who have done some fantastic imaging. So you can uh, hear about the work that they've done. Very, very interesting group. This is my website, uh, Astronomy NJ. This is how you find me, uh, astronomynj.com. It's where I list my programs that I do. Um, but most importantly, here's how you can contact me. It's just simply paul at astronomynj.com. I'm going to be taking questions in a few minutes. If I don't get to your question or if you think of one later on, don't hesitate to shoot me an email and I'll be glad to answer it for you. And like I said, if you're interested in uh, joining me on the 18th for a, a YouTube uh, podcast, uh, send, let me know that information uh, as well. Um, so uh, this slide is uh, usually for the younger crowd in the group, but hey, you never know. So I always like to encourage the youngsters that this could be you and that uh, who knows what's yet to come. So with that, I thank you very much for having me and I'll now open this up to any questions that you might have. So I think the way this works is you have to unmute yourself. Uh, we can't unmute okay. everybody. I have, I have a question. Oh, okay. What's your name? Nick. My name Hi, Nick. Is, uh, Hi, Nick. Hello. What is the uh, weight of the uh, helicopter on Mars? Is it four pounds on Earth or four pounds on Mars? Good question. It's four pounds on Earth. So okay. take 38% of four pounds, and that's what okay. it is on Mars. Yeah. The other one would be what is the what's what are the uh, constituents of the atmosphere in on Mars? Mostly carbon dioxide. There's some traces of oxygen and water vapor and a few things like that, but I think it's something like 98% carbon dioxide. Thank you. You're welcome. Paul, it's Bruce Blum. What is the life expectancy of the new rover? About two years. Uh, one one Mars year. Uh, but uh, Curiosity, which has been there now for six years or eight years or something like that, you know, NASA builds them tough. So uh, we hope that it'll last a lot longer than that. Uh, 
I also want to quickly mention um, that uh, I've also put together an online astronomy course too, a three three night class. So if anybody wants to uh, learn the basics of astronomy, uh, contact me also. I uh, I have that available as well. Hello, this is Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi. Well, what is the ultimate goal? A lot of effort and money is being put into this. I mean, what do you see as the ultimate goal? Well, it, it just seems that uh, we kind of want to find out about ourselves and uh, where we're going. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, where did we come from? Where are we going? <laughs> and so uh, well, I'm not sure we'll ever figure out where we came from. But where we're going is Mars is kind of like a... Uh, an older brother, uh, you know, it's it's kind of going through the same things that we've been through, and and it may be able to give us clues as how how the Earth is going to evolve in itself in the orbit that we're in, and so uh, it's just that overdriving scientific curiosity uh, that our our scientists have. Uh, just want to learn as much as they can. And again, you know, uh, uh, if I mention Elon Musk in passing, but uh, if anybody, uh, you know, is familiar with what his work and what his goals are, he wants to make uh, Earth uh, multiplanetary. And so he's he's down there in Boca Chica, Texas, building uh, starships to get uh, humanity to live on Mars. And so, um, like I said, it's the, uh, it's the only planet that could possibly uh, possibly uh, harbor our kind of life. And so uh, some people may just want to go there. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Jay. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, they go deep into and get some samples. I wouldn't be surprised if they can find any evidence of microbes because microbes can stay as in Yellowstone in the hot, hot, steamy, you know, springs. And also, they can go into deep freeze up to 60 uh, degree minus. So that'll be amazing to see if there will be any evidence. And I think that'll be the greatest, one of the greatest achievements. Yes, it, 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 it certainly will. It certainly would. Uh, um, I, I don't want to, I know Jeff Goldblum is not a scientist, but I always remember that line he has in the movie Jurassic Park, life, will fi life finds a way. <laughs> And so uh, when I hear the same things you just mentioned about how uh, they found living organisms that live in the hot springs of uh, geysers and, and can even live in radiation environments, they thrive on radiation. Well, <laughs> then maybe, maybe why not? And so that's what will be thrilling about, uh, about future exploration. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Good, good, good observation. Hi. And uh, I want to find out why Pluto was downgraded as a planet in our solar system. And nobody liked it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, that, that happened quite a few years ago. And the thing is this, um, when Pluto was first discovered, it was 1930. And they weren't looking for it. They were looking for something much bigger they knew, they, they felt, well, let me back, I don't mean to make this too long, but this is fun for me. Um, Uranus was found accidentally by looking up at a telescope, I think in the 1600s, and they found it. Then they started learning about orbital mechanics, and they started tracking the orbit of Uranus. And they said, wait a minute, something's not right here. It's not orbiting like it should be. Something is pulling on it that's farther out in the solar system. And so mathematically, it was figured out that, you know what, if there's something beyond Uranus, another planet, we mathematically think we know where it is. And, they, and the mathemat mathematicians told the astronomers, point your telescope there and look for it. And they found Neptune. And I said, fantastic. This is the first time a planet was found by mathematics. Well, after Neptune, Neptune's orbit was traced for a while, same thing. They said, hey, Something is tugging on Neptune, and it which should be in this area. Point your telescopes there and look. Well, they looked and they looked and they looked, and now we're talking really far away, I think three billion miles, and they found this tiny little speck that was moving. And they said, yay, we found this planet, and they named it Neptune. But then when they studied it more, they found out that it was really, really tiny. It's smaller than our moon. And so they said, there's no way that this could have had a gravitational effect on Neptune. So in a sense, they found it by accident. 
but you know it's the ninth planet and it got named and hallelujah well later they found out that the calculations were wrong on neptune and nothing was pulling on it so this was just luck that they found it now as the years have gone by they thought you know pluto was really big almost as big as jupiter but they said no it's smaller than our moon and so they left it alone Unfortunately, it's in an area out there that far out past Neptune where there's a lot of objects like like Pluto. Uh, one they think they found that's even almost the same size of Pluto. And with the advances in telescopes and cameras, they started finding lots of objects out there. Mm -hmm. And so I guess they started scratching their heads and they're saying, what are we going to have the kids do? Memorize 30 planets now instead of nine? And so they said, you know what? This is really a special kind of planet. And so they invented the name dwarf planet. And so a lot of the objects they found out there, it's an area called the Kuiper Belt. And it, it orbits the sun out past Neptune. Mm -hmm. And so anything they find out there, if it's not really big, uh, they just call it a dwarf, uh, a dwarf uh, planet. And so that's why Pluto was demoted. It's, uh, it wasn't uh, that anything happened mm -hmm. to it. It's just that it was kind of misnamed at the time. But that's all they knew back in 1930. Was that too much? Or did that get it okay? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, this is Jeff. I, a question on the uh, Meta, the weather station that's going to be on there. I mm -hmm. assume it's going to do typical measurements that we would do here on Earth, like temperature, pressure, relative humidity. And because of the dust storms, I assume you know it could handle maybe measuring some things around dust storms, the size of the particles or something like that. Is that, is that typically from what you know is going to happen with that weather station? I, I'm not sure about the dust particles uh, and whatnot. I don't think it is, but I, I don't know that much about it, to be honest with you. But I encourage you to go to that Mars uh, site on NASA and go right down to that. Uh, they, they, they detail every experiment in great detail. The one I did look at in detail was the oxygen generator one. And that's a fascinating little thing. Uh, and so, uh, but I haven't done uh, anything in depth on that. So that's an interesting fact. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Paul, this is Ed. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ed. Hi. Um, now that the radio telescope in Arecibo has collapsed, and I assume that was not run by, by NASA, are there any other radio telescopes like that that, are, that still exist that we can use? Arecibo is an interesting character. Uh, it uh, it's a radio telescope, but it also had radar capabilities, which they used a lot when an asteroid came. They can actually get a radar image of the surface and find out the texture and composition of the surface asteroids. And that, that's going to be greatly missed. Um, but as far as a radio telescope in itself, China built a huge one out. Uh, so I don't know what, what province it's in, but there's a, a new modern uh, uh a radio telescope in China. It does not have ra radar capabilities though. And so I don't think there's any, I don't know if there's any plans right now to do anything with that area. I hope so. But I know that they're out in the Western part of the United States, we have lots of small radio telescopes that can be linked together. And I think a lot of the research that's going on is going to be picked up by them. You know, Arecibo is fantastic, but can only look at one part of the sky at a time with, with rotation of the earth. Um, so it had its pluses and minuses, but certainly nobody was expecting it to collapse like that. That's for sure. So there are some things out there uh, that can that can take up the slack for now. Thanks. You're welcome. All mm -hmm. right. If uh, you think of a question later, again, don't hesitate to email me, Paul at astronomynj.com. If you want to join, if you want to come to my, well, you, I haven't done this before, but I'll have some kind of a YouTube channel uh, that'll have me talking about the Mars landing on, on February 18th, along with NASA. Uh, let me know. And if you're interested in an astronomy course, I'll be teaching that as well in the next couple of months. And with that, I, I thank everyone. Any last minute questions? Yes, I see. Hey, oh, just thanking me. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Oh, was a terrific job. Thank you very much. You're very thank welcome. You again. I hope all of you that attended tonight found this program as interesting as I did. And thank you very much, Paul. It was uh, very interesting. And I'm looking forward to the 18th of February at 3.30 to uh, watch the landing. So uh, thank you. 
You're welcome. And, and again, all of you that have donated to the Franklin Food Bank on their behalf, I thank you for that as well. Please hope you have a wonderful holiday season and a very happy and healthy new year. And for most of you, I will see you next year. Otherwise, I'll see you at the board on the 22nd. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.